This is the Tame Aperture Podcast. Open the pod bay doors, Cal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Welcome to the Tame Aperture Podcast, where we dive deep into films from first-time directors, indies, art house, and much, much more. Today on the podcast, we take a look into contemporary director Paul Thomas Anderson and his 1996 directorial debut, Hard Eight, starring Philip Baker Hall, John C. Riley, Sam Jackson, and Gwyneth Paltrow. A stranger mentors a young Reno gambler who weds a hooker and befriends a vulgar casino regular. I'm Gabe Beanendahl, filmmaker, film instructor, and movie enthusiast, and I'm joined by none other, I have to say it again, than the incomparable veteran podcaster and editor, Alan Martindale. Alan, how are you? I'm doing good. I, I especially liked your breakdown of the movie. Yeah, this is straight Google. <laughs> straight Google. A stranger mentors a young Reno gambler who weds a hooker and befriends a vulgar casino regular. I mean, that's pretty succinct. That's that's kind of what it is. That's kind of the movie. It's pretty much there. And uh, befriends a vulgar casino regular. I don't know that that one draws me in I don't really much. know. I'm not going to lie to you. If I read that synopsis, I'm probably not going to watch the movie. Well, <laughs> I, I don't think there is a synopsis you could give for this movie that would make it intriguing to watch. Because I don't really understand what it's even about. It's a uh, okay. Well, let's as far as genre goes. Like, yeah, I don't know how you'd classify it. Yeah, it's well, not a thriller. It's not. A, it's kind of a drama, but it's not. Yeah, it's it's, a, I would. I would consider it a drama. Yeah, yeah. Um, that clown keeps freaking me out. Yeah, sorry. There, there's a scary clown in the studio. I love it though. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> well, I'm gonna take a photo of it and then interject, intercut it with the video oh, yeah, on YouTube. Yeah. It's rad. People it's, need to see that thing. This thing is badass. It cost me a pretty penny at the Halloween store. Penny wise <laughs> free hugs nice. i know it's his spooky. name his name is hugs the clown sir hugs a lot my uh my, my eight-year-old daughter thinks he's a part of the family she loves him he's kind of fixating and that's what he makes is. him he scary is. because he i is. can't even look at you i'm yeah. like kind of making yeah. sure he's not eyeballing me that's why i'm facing the other way <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was no i mean i think the film i mean we're gonna dive into it we're just gonna go right out the gate um but i kind of want to see where you uh, some of your background on on PTA on Paul Thomas Anderson, his, um, some of his previous work and or, or movies that you've seen of his that you've liked or haven't liked or what you may have not seen. He's so he's he's kind of that guy that so well respected that I I almost don't I like the movies that I've seen that he's done yeah but I'm not in love with them. I did really enjoy There Will Be Blood. I was just gonna say I think that one. That's my favorite is, by far. Yeah. And if you haven't seen There Will Be Blood, I think that's one everybody should see. I mean, if you're talking about like, that falls in line with the possibility of like cinematic in the in the masterpiece realm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but you're right. So that one stands out, but but not so much. Well, uh, you know, like Boogie Nights is good, but it, it's a little too dark for me, a little too depressing. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other ones. Those are the main two, though, that I've, that I've seen that... There will be blood. It's just fantastic, though. That movie is so good. And Boogie Nights. Boogie Nights is good. That's the thing. It's, I mean, it's, nothing wrong with a little Dirk Diggler. Yeah, I mean everything. It, it, everything about that. I watched that movie, and I'm like, yeah, I liked everything, but I'd not walk away going, wow, that was incredible. Yeah. Have you seen Magnolia? I have not seen Magnolia. Have you seen Punch Drunk Love? Yes, I have. That's a good movie. That's a good one too. That's a and good that's one, uh, one that that the Sandman comes in. Uh, much different in in a lot of ways than what you would expect to see. I like his in. his serious role. I haven't seen Uncut Gems. I haven't either. I'm dying to see thing. that. I that, know Kevin Garnett's in it, and you're a big basketball fan, so I know it's it's got a lot of sports orientation to it. I like that gambling That's things right like up that. My alley. I'm not a gambler, but I love basketball. And I want to see Uncut Gems, and I actually <laughs> like movies about gambling. Like I liked Heart Eight because I liked the. I'm not a gambler at all. I don't like gambling. I I'm not. For me, it's too risky. I don't like it, but there's something about that culture and getting a window into that culture that's pretty fa- fascinating for me. I think we're probably pretty similar that way. I I don't like gambling because I'm that guy that's the traditionalist in that I work all I work too hard right, for my money right, and I right. don't have enough to throw away. Right, right. <laughs> I agree. I want. I, it's too risky. Right. It's just too risky. Well, I never. You never leave with a good taste in your mouth. No. You always lose. And I, I. It's one of those things where we always feel like we, we. I feel like I always have bad luck anyway. 
Yeah. In same, certain things. Same. So I'm like, I'm not going to like, I remember the last time this was years ago that we went gambling. We went to Wendover mm -hmm. <laughs> and cause it's Wendover. good old Wendover. Yeah. It's a 90 minute, <laughs> 90 minute West from Salt Lake. And, um, my, I went with my friend Shane. Okay. Shane's the kid that everything he touches from the beginning, he's good at. Yeah. And he draws that okay. luck into the gambling world. We all have that friend. Yeah, I know quite a few people like that. And we get there. I'm throwing stuff on roulette wheel, doing a little blackjack. I don't know what I'm doing. I have right, no right. clue, but I'm playing. Right. Uh, doing some slots. He throws in one quarter on the Wheel of Fortune slot machine. Oh, God. Hits and a wins jackpot. $250. Oh, my God. Walks away. It's ridiculous. One quarter. That's crazy. So anyway. See, that's not my luck at all. I no. sit down there. And I, I just like, I'll, I like playing blackjack and I'll play for like 10 minutes and I'll win a couple hands. And I'm like, okay, maybe for once I'm going to fucking win something. And then of course I, I bet big and I, I lose. Yeah. I lose you get everything. too eager. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. My problem. It's my problem. Mine's more like, I don't know what it is that fascinates me about roulette, but I like the, you know, so I'll, 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 I'll be up like 50, 60, 70 bucks. Yeah. And I'm like, that's all on black right there. And I go all in. You know what I mean? Dude, and then I'm done. Roulette and craps, you win fast and you lose, you lose fast. fast. Yeah. 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 Craps is fun, though, just because everyone's involved. Everyone's rooting for you. It's got the community yeah, vibe. I to like it. that. I like that. <clears throat> well, PTA's got some. Uh, uh, did you ever see Inherent Vice? No, that's been on the list for a while, though. Um, and it's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty good. But, but I think to, to kind of get us going, like, this is where it all starts. Heart Eight. Um, he did a, a, a short film before this called Cigarettes and Coffee. It looks like he did one in 88 called The Dirt Diggler Story. Yeah, but that's a very hodgepodge put together film. Is it? Okay. Uh, and it's still good. It's just very rudimentary. Sure. Cigarettes and Coffee has a little bit more, uh, uh, t and I don't know how to kind of describe it, but it's got a little bit more uh, familiarity with, with actual film structure. Sure. If that, if that makes any sense at all. And, uh, it also stars Philip Baker Hall who stars in heart eight. Um, and I think I, we could just sum it up by saying this is a, it is a gambling movie. It is a drama. Um, the, the film basically starts out with John C. Riley, also a departure from what I always view John C. Riley doing. Yeah. Because I always have the association mostly with uh, Will Ferrell's partner in crime. See, for me, it's Dr. Steve Brule. Okay. I can see it's that the too. the funniest fucking it's thing. <laughs> the best character of all time. I'm just going to throw that out there. But it's always got to... He, he, he kind of draws with him like a comedic nature. For sure. But in, in all the, the dramatic roles I've seen him play, he does very well. He, uh, I think we've talked about this on the show before, but I think Jim Carrey said that comedy is difficult and if you can do comedy you can do drama easy yeah that, yeah that's easy and it's interesting because we were just talking about punch drunk love you always associate sandler with this right. mid 90s classics happy gilmore billy madison but then he does something more you know dramatically toned and he's great at it mm -hmm. you know and so you're right like john c Riley. also this is a drama and he does really good and being um paul thomas anderson's first film this basically starts out with John C. Riley outside a cafe and just kind of setting up the character that he's kind of a lonely, pathetic guy who's lost all his... He's a gambler, and he's lost all his money. And it says it all in that one shot, that one long tracking shot where it just it follows him in, if, and uh, he's just sitting there hunched over outside of a diner yeah. in Reno or wherever the hell they are. And... There's a lot of those long tracking shots. A lot in of here. them. A lot of them. He really likes to play with that camera, like take those long, extreme shots. But this one leads in. It introduces us to the character. We know that he's he's basically lost everything that he had. We don't know why. We don't know where, even if it's Vegas or Reno or wherever he is. I don't. At least from this impression of watching it this time, I don't know where exactly he is. But he's in a, in a gambling city. Um, and then Sydney who's the character played by Philip Baker Hall approaches him and it seems very abrupt and kind of out of place. Like, why does this guy even care about some random guy? It outside feels like diner? he's going to use him for something. It feels sinister. Yeah. 
And we, we come to learn later that it's kind of contrary to that. Right. But it does feel a little off and you're not really sure why. But I, I actually, what it did for me in the first scene when he offers him to basically, uh, if, he, if, he, if, he, if he spotted him a certain amount of money, uh, he, could get, he starts talking about how he could play the game. Right. And how he could get in, he can get a, a, a hotel for a night and he could get a free dinner. Right. And he can do all this stuff if, if Sydney basically shows him the ropes about how he can manipulate the system. Yeah, and John's ultimate goal is he's trying to earn six grand to bury his mom. Yeah. Because his mom died. Yeah. And uh, it sounds like he was very desperate, and that's why he's going to Vegas to gamble. Yeah. And he doesn't know the first thing. He's very childlike, which he John C. Riley's really good at playing those characters because Dr. Steve Brule is basically a child. Yeah. So, And I'm, I'm probably going to mention that character. You're going to keep like, referring back all to All night long, all night long. But he, he, he is very childlike, and he is very... Uh, He's lost. He's lost. He doesn't know what to do, and he doesn't know. He doesn't even have an identity. Well, I mean, now you keep using that 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 definition. You're saying like childlike, and all I think about is Step Brothers. Yeah. Oh, right, right. Because he's, <laughs> he's, yeah, he's exactly like that in a forty year old boy. Exactly. Um, and he kind of has that a little bit in a different mm -hmm. uh, style, mm -hmm. but he still has that. He's more just naive. Yeah. In this one, I mean, he still has maturity of being an older adult. Right. But yeah. But um, but still has that boyish kind of uh, innocence um, based on being naive. Uh, but Sydney offers him uh, how to play the game kind of. Uh, but he also get he just it starts out. And this is an this is an ode, I think, to his short film Cigarettes and Coffee, because he basically tells uh, John that he'll get him cigarettes and coffee if they go inside. They start having this discussion about cups of coffee and how things uh, kind of play out. And so basically. This is where he divulges all the different stuff about what happened and his mom and and uh, all those kind of things. And Sydney, this is where Sydney tells him he'll he'll advance 150 bucks to him. Um, and he talks about and uh, how to comp hustle, yeah, which I, I didn't know was a thing. I, I still, even watching it, I still don't understand what they were doing. It's it. So this this I was kind of looking up because I was like, what are they? What it's it's comp hustling. Okay. So it is so this is an actual. It's thing. an actual thing okay. from the research I'm doing, um, where you get all the compliment complimentary items and services that are given out by the casinos. Um, you know the ones they give to players to encourage them to keep spending money, right. and the way you do it is that this system somehow works that you give the the idea or the impression that you're bigger than you are and how you rotate your money through. Okay. So he was going and getting credits and then he was spending money and then going back and forth as if... It, he, I don't know the technicalities of it, but I just know that there was some, uh, it forms some kind of impression that he's a big spender. Okay, I was way off base because I thought I thought he was going and actually kind of scamming money off these guys, but really what he was doing, he was just making it look it's, like he's spending a shitload of money because he goes to multiple cashiers. Yeah, and the more money he's bringing to them, the more they think he's spending. So then they're like, "We'll give you a room, we'll give you a meal, we'll give you tickets to a show." Okay, that makes yeah, more because sense. who's ever running the floor or however it works, like I'm, I could be way off here, right? But that's what it is, and okay. they're they're looking at him, going, "Oh, he's actually moving the room, right. and he's doing stuff." It's a, it's some kind of build of impression. I gotta think these days that's not so easy. I don't to know do. that it flies as well now, yeah, twenty five yeah. years later. But maybe in the mid nineties, that was a thing. Right, right. Uh, and I could see it being a thing. But that's what he's doing. He's basically comp hustling, and then he kind of takes him under his wing, mm -hmm. which is kind of strange. I'm not sure why he's why he cares so much about this guy. It right. does kind of generate a little bit of. We find out some things later, but I'm like, why does he care so much about this? Well, dick? and some of the things Sydney says to him, he's like, I'll talk to you later. And John says, when? And he says, I'll find you. You know, it just feels like sinister, like he's got some underlying plan. And so I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop the yeah. whole time. I was like, going to set him up with something. Or, yeah, or, yeah. You know, uh, but it, none of that happens. And then basically it cuts to like a two year later. Uh, concept yep. and basically John's come under Sydney's wing and is his protege he's dressing like him yeah he's drinking what Sydney drinks uh, he's smoking the same cigarettes that Sydney's smoking he's basically found an identity through this guy yeah he's found a father through this guy yeah and 
I gotta say, I love Philip Baker Hall in this. In oh, he's this, great. His perf- he's great. There's such a casuality or casual approach to how he acts. Right. I don't know what it is. It, it's it's that dragnet thing, but without go like it, he's very serious and and by the in matter of fact, but it's not. But there's a sincerity to how he exa- does it. Exactly. It's not and. I, I remember him from the old Seinfeld episode when he was like the library detective. That's right. And so I, I kept thinking the whole time that, you know, I kept seeing that, waiting for him to bust out that kind of thing. Um, and plus kind of the sinister vibe I got in the opening. I just was expecting something deeper, but I love the way he played this character. Yeah. I don't think anyone, and I think this goes actually for the entire cast. I don't think anyone could have made this movie as interesting as it is other than the people who played these parts. Yeah, I think where he succeeds in this film as a first-time director is in his casting. There's no doubt. No doubt. Like I agree that, 100%. That is a, a, such a huge, crucial piece to it. Sometimes I think you can get away with miscasting just based on either the writing or, 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 or you can, you, can um, you know, man, you can basically give the illusion through style or right, however you right. do it. But I agree with you. I think he kills it in the casting here. He does a great job. I mean, it really is. It's kind of boring if if you don't have interesting people playing these parts. Yeah, because I don't think the part, like, if you look at some of his later work, I think the writing, of course, is stronger. I think it just Definitely. naturally would grow as a writer-director over time. Um, and I don't think the writing's... It's good in terms of the dialogue, like, and how people interact, but, like, the story structure and how it builds doesn't get overly exciting and right. at least until the end where things start to, to climax a little bit. Well, I think even, you know, the, the few movies I've seen from, from Paul Ta- Thomas Anderson, I think he relies on a strong cast in all of them. That's true. Because I mean, it, there will be blood is a great, it's so great. And I hate keep, to keep bringing it up, but without Daniel day Lewis, I don't think it's even a fraction as, as good as it is. Is that even fair though? Cause like, I, well, it, I, it, it's right, Daniel right, day Lewis. Right. So you could like put him in, Whatever right. role, and he's gonna he's gonna, he's destroy, gonna it. destroy it, right? Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's pretty much a, it's a, it's a, it's a common known thread that he's one of the greatest actors oh, in contemporary. There's times. no doubt, and I and still everybody think agrees. I, I know, but I still think he's underappreciated. If that makes any sense, everyone knows it and everyone agrees, but I don't think he's as celebrated for it. Yeah, because he he's not as interested in putting himself out there right. outside of the movies, right? He don't give a shit. He doesn't give a shit. And I love that. I know. Yeah. So I, every podcast should have a Daniel Day-Lewis side note. Oh, my God. In fact, From here on it's out, almost a crime that we haven't. That's the first one point. we've given. It's, it really is. That's our first Daniel Day-Lewis shout out. Ugh. We've talked about Dennis Hopper, but not Daniel National Day-Lewis. National treasure. National treasure. <laughs> and he is, and he always will be, he even, in, even in passing. Um, and now we have Daniel Day-Lewis in that mix. So... Opening scene, uh, Sydney, John get introduced. They have cigarettes and coffee at the, the diner. And then uh, John just kind of randomly goes in Sydney's car. And then they get to, I think it's Reno or Vegas. And, and now he's under his wing and it flashes to two years later. And he's got a protege. Sydney's got a protege. The dialogue's written really well. And up to this point, we're, you know, 20 minutes into the film. And, and it's... There, there's something intriguing about it. I was still intrigued. Like sometimes you can get right. bored pretty quickly. Do you know what I mean? There you can some walk parts, away and be like, yeah, I don't. There were some points where I got a little bored, but uh, it there's... wasn't excruciating. It was like, okay, let's just pick this up a little bit. But up to this point, I'm still, I'm very, very intrigued because nothing's really happened, but it's it's just interesting. And, and the characters are so interesting and the actors are so interesting. Yeah. And plus, I like I said, I, I enjoy getting a view into like the gambling world. The world, yeah, the world still in, is pretty intriguing. Um, and the and so if you like casino world and and all that kind of stuff, gambling world, I should say, you'll I think you'll like you'll be kind of drawn into that. Um, then it the, the flash forward two years later, and basically we get the introduction of the next character in the story, uh, Clementine. And Clementine is played by Gwyneth Paltrow, another really great cat. This is where the casting's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and basically, she is a cocktail waitress who I would say moonlights 
as a hooker? Yeah, it kind of hints at it at first, and you're not quite sure how far she goes. But it's it's definitely um, implied that the casino likes her to show extra interest in in the male in the male uh, customers that are spending money at the casino. Right. She's a cocktail waitress, and Sydney gets introduced to her first. Now, keep in mind, Sydney's in. He's an older gentleman, right? Sixties, uh, and we get introduced to Clementine through him. And she's his cocktail waitress. I th- it feels like there's going to be um, an interesting departure for Sydney that, that they're basically he's going to become the old scoundrel. That's it what I thought. Like it. That's it what feels I thought. Like it. Yeah. Uh, even even his, his classy delivery and how he is as a character, you're like, okay, now he's going to twist and become Harvey Weinstein. Oh, you totally feel like it. And, and the fact that it's obvious that John and Clementine – like each other and they're interested in each other but even the way she kind of flirts with with sydney and calls him the captain it just feels like the opening's wide and he's gonna take it and he's gonna he, he yeah he feels it, i'm just waiting for him to be a scumbag that's exactly what i was thinking because the entire then, movie when she he and, and uh sydney's pretty uh he's pretty intuitive mm-hmm. so uh he notices that clementine's been flirting with all the different uh men around the 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 bar and then after he and and after she closes her shift he actually waits outside the hotel or the casino of a room of one of the guys that she was flirting with and of course she walks out and she sees him right and she starts even thinking oh he's followed me all the way this old man this scuzzball creeper this creeper Creeper. (laughs) has followed me and now he wants some yep uh, that's what I thought the whole time. Well, well, that, and it's it's reasonable to think that because he's he's st- standing outside smoking a cigarette and staring at her as she's coming out. Yeah, I mean, what else is he gonna want? And she walks over, calls him captain. He says, "I you need to you need to have a good room for the night. You need to clean up. You need to you know take care of yourself, etc." And he takes her back to his room or to John's room because they're John and Sydney are in the same hotel or same casino. Takes her, takes her back there, and takes her to the back room. Shows her the master bedroom of the of the suite. Right. And you're like, okay, it's really no. Yeah. And she even says, pretty deliberately. Oh, straight up. Like, do you want to fuck me? Right. And he's like, basically, he comes like, is that what you think? And he's like, no. And then he kind of tones it down, and you realize he's actually. I'm not sure of his motivations, though. I think I, I think I know his motivations. I wonder is it is it all for John? I think it's all for John. Okay, because he owes John, and we find yeah, out later. We find out he owes John something, a, a big debt, and I think he's trying to he's trying to do everything he can to set for John, up. right? But he does it really creepy. He does it creepy. Like he's standing above her while she's sitting on the bed. She he follows her in there in the first place. It just feels it feels gross. But he does he is he is setting her up in a genuine way. Like he wants to help her out. Right. He's not trying to be the creeper. We find that out. But she's in John's bedroom and he tells her, Look, John's not gonna bother you tonight, like that kind of whole thing. And then the next morning, John and Clementine are just chatting it up in a in a very kind of they're hitting it off. Right. In a nice conversation. Right. right. Um so so anyway, we kind of get introduced to this. She's a cocktail waitress hooker. <laughs> um, well, and we f- we forgot. Yeah, we can't forget my man Samuel L. Jackson. That's true. We were introduced to him. Well, this is Jimmy. the thing. He has so many. The PTA films have so many. The the actors that he gets to play these roles because it's not a it's an important role, but it's mm-hmm. not a lead role or overly significant role in terms of right. But he gets Jimmy, played by Samuel L. Jackson, who befriends John. Right. And they're just... And Jimmy's a little bit sly. He's kind of uh, he kind of in your face. He feels like the type of guy who would hang out in a casino town. Yes. Like the typical kind of guy, like kind of sleazy, kind of scummy, but he lives very comfortably in that world, and he has no problem with it. Whereas Sydney is the old school... Gambler. He also, yeah, but he also feels like if you were to travel back to the 50s or like if you were to go visit the Godfather Casino right, right. with Michael Corleone, right. like that's who Sydney would be with. Back in a classier time. In a classier time. Where 50, ev- yeah. everyone 
you know, they were wearing suits. They they shaved, clean shaven, smoking cigarettes. Yeah. And having a good time. And it was, you know, you, you feel it with Sydney. Like, it was a much better time then. And I think that's where he has an immediate disdain for Jimmy. For Jimmy, because Jimmy's that. He's kind of, I mean, I, I, this could sound wrong, but he's got like a pimp factor to totally, him. Totally, totally. <laughs> you know, his character has that little bit right. of little bit of an eccentric pimp factor. Well, and I think Sydney might even be a little a little closeted racist too. Not, yeah, not over the bit, but he says, you know, Jimmy tells him he does security. He says, oh, in parking lots, and Jimmy's at, he's security for the hotel. Yeah, for the casino. Yeah, you know, so I think there's a little bit of a racism there. I mean. Maybe just kind of ingrained old man racism that all everyone's grandpa has. The generational. Yeah, the generational racism <laughs> yeah. where they're not bad, but, you know, but That's they just have it in them. You can't use those words, grandpa. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Come on now. Yeah. We're in a different time. Exactly. A better time, but we're in a different time. Yeah, that's funny. He does have a little bit of that in him. I think so. For sure. Um, so we get introduced to Jimmy. So basically, our, our main characters are all laid out. Yep. We have... Sydney, we have John, we have Clementine, we have Jimmy, and these all all these characters will come in some way or another head to head as we move through the story. Um, and I I gotta say, goddamn Samuel L. Jackson's fun. He's so good. He's just so fun. I can't think of anything that he's done that I've just been like I'm not interested in watching. I may have not been super interested in some movies he's been in, but he's always the best part of those movies. I mean, Snakes on a Plane is the worst movie ever made. I've never seen it, but I don't like You'll how, love it. How is though. he not great in that, you know? He's when somebody amazing. can take a step back and be like, "I know what I'm doing." Right, right. I don't need to be, you know what I mean? Right. Take myself overly serious. I understand what this is right. and then portray that. And it, and he always seems to do that, and even in more serious roles, uh, he, he you know he's always fun to watch. I mean, I, I'm going through his IMDb right now, and it is it's easy about to forget 3, how thousand titles. God damn, many movies he has done. I, it's taking me forever to scroll down. I think his all time box office is in the billions. It has to be. Like if you were to add all the movies, yeah, it up, has it's, to be. It's in the couple billions. It's crazy, man. He's crazy. I mean, so many. He's done like 10 movies in 1990. <laughs> <laughs> like just in that year. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to go out here in a, in a contemporary sense and say he has also got the national treasure. Yeah, I agree. As an iconic actor. I agree. Like he just does. Yeah, he's got that thing. Who's got to get these snakes and on this motherfucking <laughs> plane? <laughs> Anybody that could come out with uh, 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 your voicemail. Remember this when Snakes on a Plane came out? Did oh, you yeah. remember this? Yep. And you could call a number in, and it was a recording of him that you could put on your yep. voicemail. Oh, it's my God. It's the greatest God. thing ever. Amazing. Who didn't want Sam Jackson on their voicemail? Yeah, and he is just in full force in this movie, too. Oh, he's great. Full force. And he does become an integral character. He does. So, I mean, it's not that he's just, you know, the 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 character to kind of bring some, uh, kind of alleviate the seriousness it's, of the It's not of the Christopher thing. Walken in Pulp Fiction. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. It, it actually does serve the story having him in there. And then we'll talk about, um, so we get all the, all the characters introduced and then the, they get a, a call the next day, right? Um, John and, and Clementine go out shop. This is, this dynamic was weird though. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong here? And what I mean by that is like, Clementine and John, like Sydney's like, you guys need to go out tomorrow. You need to buy Clementine clothes. Like, I guess, like you said, he's just trying to set it up so that they have an opportunity to get to know each other. I think so. Um, but it does seem like a bit abrupt and like off. No? And Without the back motivations, which right, we'll get right, to. Right. And uh, people will understand what those motivations are in just a minute. But without those... It's like, why do you, why do we? That's what I kept thinking throughout the whole movie. But he definitely, regardless of whether you know his motivations or not, he has built some sort of relationship with John where he is his protector. He's his father figure, no doubt. And he wants to do anything he can to make John happy. I think that's what it is. I think he also has kind of a soft spot for Clementine. Now, I think, well, I think what it might be, it might be that thing where uh, a parent... You know, your, your your kid 
finds a girlfriend or a boyfriend and they're aut- and you automatically love them because your kid loves them that right. type of, I think that's kind of what it feels like to me it feels I think like- it has a little bit of that and it also has later because he's talking to Clementine and if you remember she asks him if he has kids or mm-hmm. he's married and he says he's divorced and he has two kids and then she goes do you you know what are where they live and all that kind of thing and he's like I don't know because I haven't talked to him for a long long time right so it's almost in, in, in the same way you're saying, but I think also part of the motivation now that we're talking through it is also that he's, he's kind of, he's trying to help two people that would resemble his children. I think you're right. I think you you're know, right. There's a little of that in and there And she too. even mentions when she asks him if, if he has kids, she says, do you have any real kids? And, which, and he even says they're close to her age. Like right, he's, right. He's, he's referencing right, the age right. uh, similarity. So even she sees the father-son dynamic between... Uh, him and John. And so, I mean, that kind of, that one little word, you know, any any real kids, that kind of clued me into what's going on here. But I I think it, I think you're right. And I do think it's a lot of that. I just want to make John happy. And this is what he wants. And I got to do anything I can to help to facilitate this. Yeah. And we're going to tell you in just a minute why he wants to make John happy. But before we do that, they, uh, one thing that I wanted to backtrack on that I accidentally skipped over is, we talk about all these characters and these actors that he has in these films. We forgot about Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh, God. D- okay. <laughs> <laughs> the best part of the movie. Oh the best God. part of the movie. Philip Seymour Hoffman has a mullet. They gave, <laughs> they gave him a mullet. Oh, my gosh. His, but his performance, too. It's amazing. It's so good. At the craps table. He's I so mean, great. In memoriam for Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, hilarious. Oh, God. And it's a brief moment, an interaction between Sidney, the old man, and Philip Seymour Hoffman, who's the drunk, over-the-top guy playing Mm -hmm. craps, trying to, you know, get the heart aid or whatever they're trying to roll. And he's just giving him a hard time. The whole, you know, it's just, it's so funny. Well, and to me... And his mullet. Come on. The mullet. The mullet. It just, it got me. It got me the second I saw it. (laughs) Uh, and I don't, I don't quite understand why this scene's in the movie, other than just to reinforce the fact that Sydney's time has passed him by. I think you're right. I think you're hitting it right on the head because it's just to kind of show the generational differences. Because right. once again, Sydney's in the nice Goodfellas gangster right. suit, classy, and Philip Seymour often has. A mullet. He has a mullet, right? And he has like the the loud, the rock shirt on with the overthrow flannel and like smoking and like he's loud and obnoxious and his time's passed. I think you're right. I think that's what it's kind of alluding to. Um, So I had to bring that up because we can't forget about uh, that homage (laughs) to Philip. So good. I think if (laughs) I think if you're gonna watch the movie, just be prepared for to laugh at that particular section. He's so funny. He he does it so well too. And, and once again, another actor that is is incredible. Right. Have you, you seen know? The Master? I never saw The Master. I never saw it either. It's on Netflix right now. Is it? Okay, I'm going to have to check it that is. one out. So if, yeah, the, the PTA portfolio on Netflix um, is there. So uh, now after that, it's the next day, basically, and Sydney gets a call from John. It's the, now the night of the, of the following day. He gets a call from John, and John's in dire straits. John needs his help. We don't know why necessarily mm-hmm. right at the beginning, but John seems pretty out of it, seems pretty nervous and scared, right. and says, you need to come to this place. So he goes to the hotel, to the motel hotel, and he gets to the room, and there's John, Clementine, and a this random dude who's knocked out on a bed. Right. Bloodied head, unconscious. And I, I got to say that the way he built the tension here and the, not the, not suspense in in the traditional way, but I wanted to know what was going on because you have Sydney at the door, first mm-hmm. of all, talking to John through the door. And John's just like, are you going to help me? You got to promise you're going to help me. And Sydney's just open the door, just open the door. Tell me what's going on. He gets inside the, the hotel room. We still don't see what's going on. Yeah. The, the lights are off. And then finally, Sydney turns on the lights. He looks over. John looks over. We don't see what they're seeing. And they're talking like, what the hell happened here? And I'm thinking John killed Clementine. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. And so, but A the little fact twist. that 
he held he, he he held the mystery for so long. I was dying to know what the hell is going on in the hotel room. Yeah. And it was a little underwhelming when I saw it. <laughs> You're like... I was uh, expecting a bloody mess all over the place. Overweight fat guy lying on a right, bed with a bloody right. head. I th- exactly. I was, I was Alan's waiting... All, I wanted more blood. <laughs> God damn it. Not enough blood. <laughs> but this is the point where I thought all sh- all hell was going to break loose. It was going to all go to shit. This, this is what I also thought. Like, Sydney... I thought Sydney was going to tear some shit up. Yeah. I thought he was going to go full gangster. I did too. And be like, you, you idiots. Get, you get that feeling that he's got some gangster in his past. Yeah, you do. And that, that the character's built pretty well that way, right, I think. Right, right. But they get there. Clementine's also losing her mind. And essentially what happens or has happened is that this the guy that's been knocked out was a guy that Clementine went with, Hooker, right? Right prostitute she met him at a bar met him at the bar followed him back to the not followed him but went back with him to the room they had sex he doesn't pay right and that lights her fire that ticks her off she, yeah rightfully so right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're entitled to feel that way clementine <laughs> you got fucked yeah. literally literally and there's no money coming your way uh which was your intention right but it, it it John's now there and they've knocked this guy out and they're threatening to try to get the money from him, which they call somebody. It's his wife or his girlfriend they, or they something. They call his wife. It's his wife. Right. And I thought that was funny. Like of all the people, of all the call. Pe- like his wife, if, if they're if, now, if she first off, does the wife actually, is she going to believe that some random people, right, right. You know, this story, I guess it depends on how well she knows her husband. I mean, if he's the ass that we know that he is. My guess is she has a clue. She's got a clue yeah. into that. But secondly, why would she care? If they, I'm, if they call, we, you owe me $300. No, I don't. Well, and it's three. I mean, it's a lot of money, I understand. But it's $300. And that number becomes pretty important in a minute when Clementine doesn't want to leave. And yeah. she's going to go to jail for $300. Because they've kidnapped this guy, they've threatened to kill him, they've held him for ransom, um, and also they drop a bomb on Sydney that they got married earlier in the day. That's the bomb that was a, was a, it was a little bit of a shocker. Well, I I when when Sydney goes in the hotel room, I noticed there was a wedding ring on John's hand. Oh, you and did? I was like, oh, that's new. That's- Where did that come? Like, is he married? Is this a backstory? Did they just forget to take it off him before he went and shot the scene? So that's I, observant, Alan. Yeah. Well, he wiped he like wiped his forehead or something, and I I, I saw the wedding ring. I was You're like, like what's, what's going on here? But here's the thing with that part of the scene where, uh, great acting by the way. Like yeah. everybody's Everybody. really good yeah. at, at. But I just mean like I had a little bit of a discrepancy with it. In that I was like, already they got married already. Right. One day, and I guess you're in Vegas or in well, a, in a in a gambling city. To me, it makes sense for the character because John is an over. He's a child. He, I mean, he did follow Sydney in a car the first time he met him. So <laughs> he literally now got in the you're, car you're with starting him. to tie it together right. and make it he, make sense. He's a child. He's lost in the world. How many times have we heard of you know kids doing stupid things like this, going off and getting married? I know, but this is where, as a viewer outside of filmmaking, I have to. Uh, separate my logical brain from like this would never happen to me i would never marry someone in a, in over a day of knowing them well well i wouldn't either but but i just mean you're right and i agree with you now we're talking through i go okay yeah i mean here's the a, part for me that doesn't seem logical so the marriage i can buy that okay. because they are they're, they're they're very just they're just lost kids you know they're they're very ignorant of the world and they think they're in love kids do dumb shit even if they're full grown adults um, the thing that I didn't get is they got married. They went to the bar. She just wandered off to find a John. <laughs> like you just got married and you just can't. It, it's it almost like $300 though. It's almost like she's addicted to being a prostitute or something like a heroin addict just wandering off to go get their junk. You know, it just, it didn't, that is the part where I'm like, what? No, that's, that's a good, I think that's what, well, that's the logical brain. Like, uh, okay, that's maybe PTA missed that one. Maybe. Or He's maybe. a great filmmaker, but maybe he missed yeah, that one. Maybe Look, he did. This, maybe like, he did. On your first time out, you miss uh, a few. Yeah. You don't hit every you shot. You gotta have some plot conveniences in there. You have to. <laughs> Cause you're right. Like, uh, 
because then when they divulged to Sydney that they got married and John starts saying, I love her and all this stuff. And then she's like, I don't want to, this is where another it got a little bit, a little bit rocky here for me. Sydney starts kind of diving into it. He's trying to figure out. Well, first he tries to bounce. He tries to leave. That's true. And John draws him back. Right. And Sydney, as the fatherly figure, gets sucked back in. Right. He goes back in. And then he sits down with Clementine. He tries to figure out, hey, he's going through step by step. He's trying to figure out the whole day, leading the, all the events leading up to this. Um, but then the, he asks Clementine, you know, do you love him? She's right. talking about John. He's talking about John. And, he, he's, and she says, yes. And then this is where I had a little discrepancy because Clementine and John start kind of bickering and fighting. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, John <laughs> pulls back and lets one rip and tells her, you're slaps my wife. Her, slaps and her across then, the face. Because they're fighting and arguing. Right. Slaps her right across the face. We go domestic violence right out the gate. Immediately. Immediately. And, and I thought, okay, she's running off. And then like you said, she's running off with other guys. He's first night beating the shit out of her. <laughs> but hey, he was immediately sorry for it. So I mean, the only <laughs> way that this works is that John C. Riley is a good actor. Right. And you can see that he it's look, I'm not condoning it, but you saw that there was some kind of immediate what did I just do? Right, right, for sure. But still, nonetheless, like the even if this marriage succeeds beyond a, a year or a week, right? It's not. It's gonna. It's only downhill. But here, you're. Actually, you can't start a marriage this way. That. It's like you cannot start it's a not marriage built this on way. any sort of foundation no. at all. You're but, you're going out with a John, and I'm hitting you. Right. Here's the thing, though. I think it. Maybe helps he was us. mad that she went out with the John. I, oh, I and think it he built definitely up, was. And it built up, I, and then he took he laid one on her. He kind of acted like her pimp, like, we're going to get this money, you know? <laughs> get like, that 300 Got to get bitch. that money, yeah. And uh, But here, here's the thing. I think it helps us relate to Sydney, because Sydney walks into this situation probably thinking the exact same things that we're thinking. Like, what True. the fuck are you doing? You you guys are idiots running around. And that was the best part. Is when Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, Clementine, kept saying... We're not stupid. We're not stupid. And Sydney had those little quips. He's like, this is a pretty stupid situation. Like, <laughs> he yeah, did, you're not he, stupid at all. He did know? sound very fatherly. Yes, exactly. And so it, I, I think it, it kind of, we're able to relate to his character quite a bit. But we're also questioning his motivation because why is he still sticking around? Why yeah. is he so goddamn loyal to this guy? Yeah, why does he care so much? But you really see, they've kind of alluded very, very vaguely to the fact that Sydney's probably some sort of gangster in the past because he knows he just he knows that town so well he knows that world so well so you kind of figure he's got something but what cemented it for me was when he hits the dude who's on the bed yeah he wakes up and when Sydney goes and and punches him to knock him out again that's when I'm like oh shit he knows what he's doing yeah he's a gangster he's been there before right yeah right and <clears throat> even in this messed up situation you're right Sydney's supporting him. Clementine or John uh, have the most fucked up marriage starting out from the left first 24 hours ever. <laughs> Maybe ever, not ever. I mean, it's close. It's gotta be top five. <laughs> Nobody meets someone in 24 hours and has all this no. whirlwind happen. Uh -uh. Um, and, and it's a story, so it's fun and you can follow it. But it seems unrealistic. <clears throat> but, Just a little. <laughs> Just a little. Um, John... Or not, sorry. Uh, Sydney sent... So this is the other thing. He wants them... Everybody's worried. And they're worried about this guy figuring out who they are and then mm -hmm. ratting him out for assault and then all these other things, right? Right. So... And, and, and Sydney basically sends him off. Yeah. He says, get out of the city. Yep. And he sends Clementine and John on the road. He says, get out of here. Let things cool off. And I'm trying to go, I'm trying to think, is that enough? Once again, the logical side of my brain is going, is that enough motivation for them to just bolt out of the city? Well, they kidnapped a dude, threatened to kill him, and they contacted Does his wife. Does this dude who's drunk off his ass True. ever going to remember anybody? Well, no. I, I don't think, well, I, I don't think so. But here's the thing. They build it up and build it up and build it up. 
There's a lot of panicking. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We got to get out of town. Clementine doesn't want to. They got to convince her to go. It, it's like a big thing. And then the problem just kind of goes away. Like, it's just like they're gone. They leave. And it's just, they, it kind of goes away. Yeah. He, the, the John doesn't ever, you don't ever see him again. Right. Or he doesn't ever, like, you don't ever see the pursuit of cops or no. detectives or no. people trying to figure shit out. No. Um, even Jimmy says the dude was walking around the town like nothing happened. Yeah. Because he didn't remember. Because he didn't remember. So and why he was did, embarrassed. He was with a hooker and he's married. That's and they embarrassing. Called, they called his wife. Right. And tried right. to right. extort money. Exactly. Um, but they anyway, Sydney sends him off, uh, John and Clementine together, because they're married. <laughs> they do look happy in the car, though. It, they do. They do look happy. it cuts back to them driving, they seem happy. And anytime two messed up individuals get together, usually... <laughs> Works out pretty good. Um, I see no problems I in the future. I see no problems in the future at all. Their kids will be great. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> the way they tell the grandkids about every, how they met. Every People listening are like, you're such a dick, Gabe. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the next big kind of, because we're, we're just past about an hour, essentially, of the film. So we're getting closer to this. But the, the next big thing, <clears throat> Excuse me. The next big thing is Sydney meeting up with Jimmy. Yep. And now Jimmy trying to ex- like extort or blackmail. Yeah. Sydney, um, based on this real hard piece of information that was the motivation that we were alluding to earlier, which is what is it, Alan? Sydney killed John's father. Okay, so now real gangster Sydney's yeah, legit. Right. And Jimmy talking about how he used to work a gig in Atlantic City. And he knows back all east, those old guys who love to talk. And he knows all the guys that love to talk. And they were talking about this incident. And it's basically talking about how Sydney killed John's dad, yep. shot him in the head. So this kind of, and, and now. Sydney has some obvious remorse for what he's done because he's left an orphaned child. Yep. And so this is why John has been, or no, I'm sorry, Sydney has been helping John and mentoring him as a protege. Yep. And no. Sydney, I mean, Sydney's really, so Jimmy pulls a gun on Sydney. And you actually see, this is the first time where I felt like Sydney wasn't in control of what was going on and he didn't know how to handle a situation because everything else, even in the, in the chaos of what was going on with the dude in the hotel room, he still knew how to handle it. He, he looks petrified when Jimmy pulls the gun. And that was, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Cause Jimmy's like, give me 10 grand right. or I'm going to tell John that you killed right. his father. Right. And you're right in the car when he pulls the gun on him, he does, he does look like he's lost control of his confidence right. that he would have had as a, as a straight gangster. But then I wonder, based on what happens later, if he knew what he was doing the whole time. But he did. I was just going to say, I yeah. think, <clears throat> although that's the impression that he gives, he's setting it up in his head already. Yeah. Dude's a smart motherfucker. This is Michael Corleone yeah. shit. Yeah. You don't it mess really around. Is. Yeah, yeah. And it really so, is. Uh, Jimmy basically says, give me, give me the cash. And, and Sydney says, I'll have a $6,000. But it's at the bank, and I got to go get it. And he's holding the gun to him. So they go... He he blackmails him for six k. Yep. <clears throat> and that's we find out the big piece of information about him killing John's dad. He blackmails him, and then this is kind of there's this little bit of a as it kind of continues. There's a little bit of a heartwarming moment. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John calls uh, as this is going on. John calls Sydney on the phone and says we're in Illinois. And, and the way this, this was cut was weird to me. Okay. Because you would hear one side of the conversation, but you would never hear the response. So when Sydney, when John's talking on the phone, you never you don't hear what Sydney says. It doesn't come back to cut back to Sydney. It just shows John having a conversation and pausing for a few minutes or a few seconds and saying, Yeah, okay, you know, just responding. But then it would cut back to Sydney doing the same thing. 
I don't know why they I don't know why they chose to do that. Yeah, that is an interesting approach. It was to, it kind of bugged me a little bit. It's just a little thing. It may have been very intentional. I don't know why what the the reasoning would be behind that, but it kind of it it just <clears throat> bugged me a little bit. Took me out of it. But what what transpires? By the way, I wanted to say one thing, which we we always do this every podcast, yeah. where we just jump over one little yeah. scene. Yeah. And the 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 piece that we missed is before Sydney sent them off on the the road trip to get out mm-hmm. of the the situation. Um, Clementine gives Sydney a cassette tape of their wedding. That's right. That's and, right. And uh, it's this really kind of nice little it's moment. It's a cute little moment. It's a yeah. cute little yeah. moment. He sees them married and they do look happy. They do look happy. Uh, albeit just after the wedding, Clementine <laughs> goes and finds a John. <clears throat> so, you know, she's they hey, looked happy in that moment. It's easy to be happy for at least 48 hours. And then she realized she needed $300. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right now. She's like, I got to pay for this wedding. Moment. Exactly, exactly. But you're right. There was a, a, a nice heartwarming moment there when, when John called Sydney. Yeah, because they actually, and, and they really allude to the, I think, the arc of the story, mm-hmm. which is uh, Sydney divulging to John that I, I he says, I love you. So they love you like a real like son. Like a real son. And then, the, so there's this kind of thing. And he's he, he's kind of achieved his goal. I mean, the motivation in the beginning of the very, when we were confused at the first part of the film, right? Right. They're like, what's this guy doing? And then now he's kind of divulged that this is the whole it, thing. It, it really is kind of a condensed version of parenthood because you find this helpless, you get this helpless little being and your goal is to raise them and marry them off, essentially. You know, that's kind of what happened. And you're going to get them out of jams and they're going to screw up and they're going to make you want to just strangle them, but you just take care of them. And you do what you can, and you you send them off into the world. Yep. And that's kind of what happened. Yep. Good point. And so, nice little moment happens. And then, back in uh, Sydney's world, he's going to go full gangster. <laughs> yep. Now that he knows Clementine and John are in that place they need to be, he's getting his money back. He's from getting the goddamn Jimmy. money back. <laughs> He breaks into Jimmy's apartment. Again, he's done this a million times. He knows exactly he knows, how to do this. And he knows exactly where the gun stash yes, is. Yes, he does. Um, wherever Jimmy's stashing his guns, he knows. Breaks in, uh, waits and waits and waits. And then Jimmy comes back with a prostitute of his own. Gets some <laughs> the language that he has with the God, it's so funny, prostitute. Man. It's so funny. It's so funny. I don't even want to say it'll make me blush. I know. Me too. That's why I'm just. <laughs> but it's. <laughs> it's just Samuel L. Jackson just just doing his thing. Just straight up doing his thing. Uh, so, so funny. He's sitting there waiting for him. And uh, when Jimmy turns the lights on to the apartment, he sees Sydney. Sydney blasts him. Over and over, over and, and over and over, and over. straight gangster. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and then tells the prostitute that Jimmy brought back to get out of the house. And then as she leaves, he takes Jimmy's dead body and takes all the money back that Jimmy stole from him. On top of the two thousand dollars that Jimmy won from the money that That's he got, true. He's betting out on top. Hold on, betting a hard eight, not just a hard eight. A two two grand on a hard eight. Two grand on a hard eight. This is something that is repeated over and over again and fails every time except for this time. Yeah. So Jimmy, or not Jimmy, uh, uh, Sydney has bet two grand on a hard eight at least twice that we've seen or that we've heard of. Jimmy mentions to him the first time he meets Sydney that I saw you bet two grand on a hard eight at a craps table. And Sydney says it was a stupid bet. Yet he does it again when he's playing with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Greatest scene ever. Exactly. Because he just had enough. He just wants, to, you know, to, to get some, I don't know, former glory or something. So he does a ballsy move that he wouldn't normally do. He bet two grand on a hard eight. Lost. So then when Jimmy gets it, it's like, holy shit, man. Holy shit. Uh, and, of course, Sydney's he's taking that money. He's yeah. finally getting his two grand on a hard eight. He's getting his money back and he's getting the money from the hard eight. And then the title of the movie. Yes. Um, Which is a much better title than the original. Yeah, it was called Sydney. Sydney, yeah. Heart Eight's much better. Heart Eight's way better. Whoever came up with that yeah. marketing. Right. Um, and then after he kills him, 
it's kind of uh, back to square one, really. And it just has this real kind of long shot of Sydney walking back into the cafe that he met John. Yep. John's now on his way, and Sydney sits down for coffee and cigarettes. Coffee and cigarettes. And so it is kind of poetically bookended. Right. You know, in a, in a nice way. I, I will say uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of cigarettes smoked in this movie. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if the trivia will tell us how many packs were smoked. Seriously, during like I'm production. a former smoker, and so it was like it was making me crave it a little bit. You're like, I just like, want. Oh one man, of that'd be so nice right now. Just constantly, yeah. constantly, they're smoking cigarettes. But I think overall, it's got a little nice kind of wrapped up. Here's your present, bow, you know, kind of yeah, tied it tied it's nice. together. It's, it's nice. nice. I think it works. Um, and that's our first introduction into PTA. I honestly was expecting a, a depressing ending. Yeah, I, it was. It just kind of I mean, felt like that kind of movie, and just based on stuff he's done before, it just I just was expecting it. Or done after. Or done after. Uh, yeah, after. Excuse in, me. In in all technicality. Right. Um. So, give me a, a little bit of your just overall impression, first time out the gate, uh, rundown, like uh, in turn, and then give me a rating. Uh, so it was good. I, I really think like we talked about the casting knocked it out of the park with everybody, all four main characters outstanding. They did such a great job. I, the story was, was a little slow. I did like the angle with the father son dynamic between Sydney and John. I really, that one kind of spoke to me a little bit. So, uh, not great. Not, I mean, not outstanding, but not, not a bad movie at all. And I definitely for a first effort out for a feature man i think he did a very good job i'm gonna go i don't want to go too low but i don't want to go too high i I think i'm gonna go 6.8 6.8 what 6.8 cigarettes cigarettes good i can go with that so let me read a couple pieces of trivia okay um we got to start out with a piece of trivia on samuel l jackson (laughs) yes please (laughs) nothing crazy but samuel l jackson starred in the hateful eight and Heart Eight, two films with eight in the titles. Now I only yeah see, with his filmography, of course. That's, that's what I mean, right. though. Like right. of all, because he's you're going to be able to find probably <laughs> matches like that throughout. Um, so one kind of interesting for the the cinephiles out there, the people that really kind of follow films quite heavily uh, and are interested in cinematography, which I think is kind of cool. This film was. Uh, Robert Ellswit. And so Robert Ellswit's a really well-known photographer, cinematographer. For a first-time director, he's pulled some pretty amazing actors in this. And so I'm wondering if he pulled uh, a well-known cinematographer at the so time. So Ellswit doesn't have the portfolio that he ends up having later. I think he kind of grew along okay. with PTA. That makes sense. Because if you look at his filmography, he's famous now as a phenomenal cinematographer. I believe he's even won an Academy Award for cinematography. But um, his he, he was doing TV movies. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. And so I think him gotcha. and PTA grew together, which is cool. I like seeing that. Yeah, there were some know? good shots in here too. I think it's beautifully shot yeah. for a very small independent film. For I sure. Mean, uh, they didn't have a whole lot of money. The opening theme music was the same music used in Boogie Nights. I saw that. That's interesting. When Mark Wahlberg, Dirk Diggler, gets, Dirk Diggler, gets jumped in the parking lot. <laughs> oh, here's the here. Okay, here's you. This, you're gonna love this. I I love it. According to Philip Baker Hall, right, who plays Sydney, mm-hmm. Philip Seymour Hoffman improvised his scenes. Including the the whole the whole crap scene was improvised. Oh my god! This two or three minute scene is hilarious. Like we talked about, this is what makes Hoffman a fantastic actor. He improvised the whole thing. That's that's insane, and he did it so convincingly. And he just he was an ass. He hit that annoying. Oh man! He just nailed it. It was like nailed fingernails on a chalkboard. It really was. It really was. But the whole time, it's kind of charming too because it's Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yes. It's like it's it's hilarious because it's him. And we look back a little bit because now he's passed. We always have that little bit of, you know, homage to him. Assistant cameraman 
uh, Michael G. Ribba turned down two weeks of working on Waterworld. <laughs> <laughs> which paid better yeah no shit but which one was better for his uh career to work on this movie i'm gonna say this one has been the assistant cameraman on every paul thomas Anderson film and so there you there go you, there you go he's good he, yeah. he's secure i'm not walking away to do right. water world right, right i'm here with you pta and then what happens pta blows up yep and then he's got a job forever forever because i'll tell you right those assistant cameramen on these big films that pta is eventually doing mm-hmm. later on they make good money oh yeah well, I, I love the PTAs that loyal. Yeah, that's I cool. I love that. And he's, like I said, works with... It's also Ellswit, right? Because Ellswit's yeah, got sure, his... Yeah, He's kind of crew, crew right, it for up. sure. The release of the film was held up for two years after the distributor went broke. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, wait, this came out in 90... This came in, out in uh, 96. 96. So, it was done, ready to release in 94 then. And he sat on it for two he years. Sat, just sat there. Yeah. So, God, do you know what? Sometimes it's amazing that movies ever get finished and released. Because yeah, there are so many moving pieces and so many different things you got to rely on. Especially now. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is there's so many places to release them and you still can't get them out. Right, right. It's crazy. This said the screenplay was originally written in 92. PTA wrote it in about two weeks. Jesus Christ. That's pretty good. That's good. That's really good. A lot of a lot of pieces here, like like you mentioned, like the acting's great. They spent about three million dollars making it. That's what it okay. says on the estimate. Uh premiered at Sundance uh in ninety six. This is another criterion collection. hmm I keep choosing these oh, ones. It with, is? It is. Okay. Um and apparently in the Criterion collection, if you were to buy it off there, you also get the opener, the short film Cigarettes and Coffee. Oh, I'd love to see that. I wonder um, if it's online somewhere. You can watch it online. Okay. I, I did. That's where I watched it. Okay. But it's a ripped VHS copy. Oh, and the is quality's it? <laughs> not that great. Yeah. But you still got to watch it. And it's actually really good. Well, I think they... Didn't they shoot a lot of that at the Sundance Lab? Probably. I, I don't know. So. I would, I that think would make did. sense. Yeah. I mean, that would make sense. Uh, the filming locations in, uh, in Nevada, right? Sparks, Nevada. The, I'm going to give you my rating, but I wanted to read... There was a couple things here on the audience reviews that I think are funny. I want to get you. I want to get you. <laughs> these are the best, man. These are, these are like my favorite things. I, I apologize because some of the words are probably not PC. <laughs> and I'm just going to read the first few sentences of these. This is a two out of five stars on audience reviews. One of the most retarded movies I've ever watched in a long time. <laughs> The uh, here, here 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 get this too. The acting is wonky and lacks emotional depth. Are you fucking See, kidding me? I thought the acting was that was the best part of the whole movie. I wonder if they're just talking about Sydney and they didn't understand the nuances of his performance. All four actors are oh much god. better today, thankfully. Oh my god. That's the worst review I've ever read. That's terrible. Not only is it not cool to use those words, but secondly, that's a horrible rundown. It's not even accurate. It's not and even close. The one thing that is solid, I mean, there's other things too, but the right. one really solid thing is the acting. For sure. Dumbass. That's, that's what makes the whole movie. Who are these idiots? Who is this ki- uh, they'll let anybody on the I'm not even going to throw out his handle because I don't want to <laughs> be that dick. <laughs> Although I should. Um, <clears throat> well, you know where you're... you're uh, First piece of hate mail is coming from. Yeah. <laughs> Weenie smack 487. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. Uh, here, here's one. I liked the good. I liked the movie off psychedelics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. Here's a one star out of five. Here's a one star. Oh, that's got to be great. A movie about absolutely nothing. <sighs> Save yourself the pain and skip this flick. About absolutely nothing. I don't know. I don't agree with that one. I, don't I really either. don't. I don't either. And we know for those that listen, Gabe can be I, I, me. I speak in the third person. I carve him alone. <laughs> um, no, I can be an apologist, right? Because yeah, sure, I, sure. I always give him that. You'd made a film. You give him the benefit of the I doubt. I always do. You do. Um, but I don't think it's, I don't think, you know, about absolutely nothing. No. And I don't no. think you need to skip it. And that's what I'm getting to is I don't think you need to skip it. I think you should watch it particularly if you're a PTA fan. Like if you, we talked about There Will Be Blood or Boogie Nights or Punch Drunk Love, um, any of those. I didn't, I haven't seen his most, the, the, the most recent one. I haven't seen 
Um, his his most recent film that uh, there's Inherent Vice is another one by the way, which is actually really good, but it's got Joaquin Phoenix in it. Um, and then more recently, he did the Fan- or, uh, Phantom Thread, and that's the one I was thinking of. Was Phantom? Thread. I haven't even heard of that one. He's such an iconic director now. Okay, he's he is a director that has an acronym. Right. Like he's right, PTA. Right, right. He's PTA. Right. So uh, that kind of sets earn that shit, You got to earn that shit. And I think that he does mostly. And I think for a first uh, first helming uh, behind the uh, camera, I think he does a great job. I agree. It's it's one you should watch. Uh, it doesn't, of course, meet up to his, his later his later work or subsequent work, of course. Right. And we talk about this every time, but I think it's so true. It's like, it's cool. This is what I love about the directorial debuts is you get to see uh, out the gate whether these guys have have anything or they don't. Sometimes yeah. they don't. And Sometimes they really don't. And even the greats don't have it. Right. And I think he does. I think it's a well put together film overall, uh, minus some of the, the little bit logical flaw, flaws. But I there those are just me being overly nitpicky, sure. to be 100% honest. I think it's a good movie. It's solidly made. Um, I would suggest go watch it um, and then watch his other body of work. There will be Blood, Punch, Drunk Love, Boogie Nights, Inherent Vice, Phantom Thread. Go watch PTA's stuff, particularly if you're looking to be... Um, the. I think what I like about his stuff is he's precise. Not necessarily a story, but story later, but the precision in which he develops characters. Yeah. Because even if the story has little wonky parts like we talked about, the characters are always intriguing. Right. The, there will be blood opening scene phenomenal. No, it's, it's I, the, everything about that. I love everything about that movie. It's, it's, I don't even understand the underlying theme. I've seen it a couple times and I still don't quite understand the underlying theme, but it's so, it's just so riveting. Everything about it. I can't, you just can't take your eyes off it. I think that's the, the perfect way to sum that film up is, is it's completely riveting. Yeah. So I go with, uh, on Heart 8, 1996, 1996 film from Paul Thomas Anderson, directorial debut. Uh, I'm going to go with a 7.4 cups of coffee. Cups of coffee. Like you did it. cigarettes. Did I'll, cigarettes do, yeah. I'll do coffee. So I think 7.4. Um, one thing we neglect, uh, audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, 83%. Not, not bad. Wow. And the tomato meter from the critics, 83%. It's an actual 83% across the board. That's online. crazy. That's I don't think I've ever seen that happen. No. Where they're the exact the, same the percentage. The critics and the audience don't usually agree. They never agree. At least not that closely. And they're always it's always the opposite of what you would think. Right, right. It, it really is. It Every always single time. Is. It always is. It always feels that way. I always feel kind of uh, bad about myself when I agree with the critics. I know, because you kind of like <laughs> pretentious like, assholes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then here we are reviewing yeah. movies. Exactly. And that, that's what this whole show is about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we are doing that. Then IMDb's got it <clears throat> at 7.2. That's pretty high. That is. Yeah, that's pretty good. IMDb is not very forgiving. They're usually a little more. Yeah. I feel like there there's a little more honesty to some of the what IMDb's yeah, doing. Yeah, I agree. And I also love that as we've instituted this over the last few podcasts, IMDb also gives the, the uh, points. So they'll go like 7.2. It's not just a straight, yeah, yeah. A straight seven. We know you're a big fan of that. We sh- I thought you were going to give precision. it. Yeah. You got to come in with the precision. I said 7.4, right? Yeah. And you could come in at it with a hard eight. Yeah. Oh, oh shit. Why did I not see that coming? <laughs> God damn it. No, but, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> that, by the way, is the best line in the movie. It is. Samuel, the, Sam. Samuel Jackson's rolling. He's like, give me a heartache just like me. Oh, God, I love that, man. <laughs> he, you're right. You're right. He's national treasure status. He's great. We're going to have to make a list of these guys who are national treasures. We're going to start it. Yeah, we're going to. That's it. We're starting a list so far on our list of national treasures. I'm going to write it down. We have Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper. We put uh, Jack on there, too. We did. Right? Yes. Yes. We, I put, personally, I put Jack on the Mount Rushmore of all time. I agree. Uh, then I, we, I love Jack Nicholson. He's great. I, I fucking love the guy. 
Alan, thanks for uh, plugging through this with me. Yeah, it's fun. It's always fun. Heart Eight by Paul Thomas Anderson. This is Gabe and Alan with the Tame Aperture Podcast. Go check us out on www.tameaperture.com and uh, join the community. Tame Aperture Podcast is produced by Dutch Angle Pictures in association with Studio B Productions. Listen, watch, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and YouTube.